Hello. Hi, Peter. Hey, Julia. Hi, everyone. Peter. Hi, Peter. Welcome. Hey. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Nice seeing you all again. And welcome. This week, we have uh, Peter Hacker presenting his research on um, modeling of token economic systems with an application to the Ocean Protocol, I, I assume. Um, but uh, we will have Peter diving deeper into the um, experiments that he's been, he's been doing over um, over the last couple of months, uh, writing this up excellently and, and um, building a simulation model. So we are super excited to hear uh, Peter's presentation. And uh, I don't know how much time you have dedicated to the presentation today, Peter, but uh, we have one hour and you can uh, present and then we can have a conversation. In the meantime, questions can be collected in, in, in the chat. Um, if you want to be um, interrupted by those questions, uh, feel free to just you know address them directly. If not, I can moderate a little bit. And um, if not, we will have by the end a uh, discussion uh, based on the questions that have been collected, plus all the questions that came up afterwards. So without further ado, let's have Peter, um, here's your stage and, and um, yeah, looking forward to your presentation. Oh, awesome. Yeah, thanks. Um, ah, fun. I see some friendly faces, hey, everyone. <laughs> um, cool. Yeah, that all sounds really good. I um, was... Yeah, so just for some context, so this is basically a modeling project that I did on the side um, this, I guess, over the summer, sort of, um, between, I had a, a break in um, uh, in semesters, um, and so I decided to spend some of my time getting some experience with modeling and um, was also interested in Ocean Protocol, so I decided it'd be a good combination, but, um, but yeah, I was sort of re revisiting the report that I wrote because um, I finished it a couple of weeks ago now um, and re was revisiting the report and there's quite a lot <laughs> to uh, that I could talk about. So um, I, I think here, I'll share my screen here, but um, I think that the plan of, oh, I can find it, there it is. Um, so I think my plan for today will be to kind of give like a high level overview of a couple of different areas um, related to the modeling work that I did and just some of the like experience that I had um, modeling and some of the learnings that I, I gathered. And, and also, I mean, like learnings related to like the actual experience of doing modeling simulations workflow um, and then also some of the like results from the simulations. Um, so there's basically a bunch of topics that I'm going to try and go over, but then I would love to like go deeper into um, any of them that we have time for, um, or if there are specific questions related to those. So, um, so yeah, the modeling of the ocean protocol. Um, I, I actually wrote, wrote up the, um, this report for the, the, the modeling and, and the reports that I, or the uh, analysis that I did, which I can share at the end. Um, but I just kind of like, there's a lot of words in there. So I just grabbed some of it <laughs> um, for this presentation, put it into slides. Um, but yeah, so the agenda that I'm planning will just go a bit over the, the system that was modeled to give some context um, about what we're looking at. Um, and then talk about the modeling goals and um, the framework that I used and the process that I went through. Um, which is actually where most of the learnings were. Um, and uh, yeah, and then talk about the model structure itself. Um, so could look at the the repo if we wanted to. Uh, and then I did um, run experiments and generated results. So I ran some simulations so we can talk more about those. Um, and then finally at the end, some learnings um, and improvements that I could make to the model or things that I learned from modeling. Um, and then just some of the challenges uh, that I think are interesting to talk about as well. Um, so yeah, what was modeled? Um, I can't really go spend that, or I don't want to spend that much time on what exactly Ocean Protocol is. It's a, it's a pretty interesting um, and I think exciting project uh, that has been like pretty closely connected to the token engineering space. So maybe some of you have already heard of it. Um, and maybe that's also why you're here today too. Um, but I just uh, will give a quick overview in um, the of the ocean protocol as it relates to what I was modeling. Um, so in general, I 
uh, spec'd out and designed a model of four of Ocean Protocol's um, subsystems. Uh, so those being the vote escrow mechanism, um, the data farming reward system, uh, the Ocean Treasury, and the Ocean Data Marketplace. Um, the main two that I was focusing on were the, um, the vote escrow mechanism and the data farming reward system. Um, so essentially, like the really quick intro of, of how Ocean works is there's this data marketplace. And as a user, you can publish data assets. It could be a data set or an algorithm, um, something like that. You see, so you would publish the data asset and then people will um, consume it. So they would pay you uh, tokens to consume your data asset. Um, so that's kind of like the data marketplace area. Uh, the vote escrow mechanism is also a common mechanism, I think, across other DeFi protocols too. But um, the idea is basically to incentivize users to lock their tokens. Um, and by locking your tokens, uh, your ocean tokens, um, so you lock your ocean tokens, and then in return, you get a certain balance of uh, vote escrow tokens. Um, and you can lock your ocean tokens for a duration of anywhere from a week to four years. Um, and the vote escrow tokens, uh, the, the reason, like the incentive to locking uh, your, your ocean tokens is that you're actually rewarded um, from the data farming reward system. Uh, so there's two main um, reward types. There's active and passive. So the active and passive rewards are allocated to holders of the vote escrow uh, token. So you have to lock your tokens in order to be eligible for data farming rewards. Um, the passive rewards are allocated to anyone who is just passively holding their vote escrow uh, tokens. And the active rewards are allocated to, um, to users who actually vote with their vote escrow tokens. And by vote, I mean um, signal. So it's called curating data, uh, or it's called data curation um, in for Ocean. So voting would be uh, signaling with your vote escrow tokens um, which data assets you think are the highest quality or will be consumed the most. Um, <clears throat> so the, yeah, so that's how the, the vote escrow mechanism and the data farming award system um, go hand in hand. And then the Ocean Treasury is obviously where the funds are coming to fund the reward system. There's a distribution schedule that was defined um, and published by the Ocean uh, team um, for the rewards. And then the data marketplace um, is important because it's where the data assets are actually consumed. And the data consumption volume is, a con is an input into calculating the active rewards. Um, so I, I didn't, the, the treasury and the data marketplace, I didn't actually um, model in too much detail, like the data marketplace, I don't model any like actual, uh, like purchasing of data assets or specific, um, uh, or specific algorithms. I kind of like, uh, yeah, zoomed out a little bit um, and, and I have assumptions as for uh, data consumption volume growth. Um, which I'll talk about later. So yeah, so those are the four subsystems that were modeled. Um, the modeling goals uh, that I had, <laughs> took a lot of iterations to get to, I guess, um, was to validate the system goal of incentivize, to incentivize locking ocean. Um, so that's kind of the, the vote escrow mechanism. Um, the, as I mentioned, the, the goal of it is to incentivize users to lock their tokens um, and get them out of circulation. It, aligns the idea is that it would align uh, the token holders with long term generating long term value for the protocol itself uh, is the uh, sort of the idea behind the vote escrow mechanism um, and it's been stated in a few basically from like reading a bunch of the ocean protocol blogs uh, i pulled out this um, pillar of their of their token economics uh, which is to incentivize locking ocean because um, that has benefits for the protocol. So I, my goal was to validate whether that um, system goal was achieved. Um, the framework that I used was uh, CAD-CAD. So I was um, implementing a generalized dynamical systems model of the economic system that is Ocean Protocol um, using CAD-CAD. Um, and the processes was many, many iterations of um, 
kind of roughly summarizing these these are the steps that um, I was iterating through. So refining the system goals um, and the modeling objectives. So this was a lot of like research and brainstorming, reading a bunch of articles that were published um, relating to Ocean Protocol, looking through their white paper, different specifications, documents, um, basically just like gathering as much information as I could. Um, designing the experiment by defining metrics, KPIs, making behavioral assumptions. So this is like trying to, you know, if I'm thinking this is the system goal or this is the modeling objective that I have, um, what KPIs, what metrics would provide insights to that, um, that modeling objective and what behavioral assumptions might I need to make or want to make in order to help me um, answer the, the question that I have about the, about the system. Um, and then specifying the model um, with mass specs and diagrams. So this is basically just kind of like, yeah, turning, turning the diagrams into um, more of a mathematical language that could be implemented in CAD CAD and then running simulations, seeing what the outcome was and then kind of like, yeah, iterating through. And I started out with actually just a very simple model of the vote escrow mechanism itself, um, just cause I was like, yeah, that's where I started. And then from there, I kind of like built out and grew um, through iterations. I expanded into modeling other um, parts of the subsystem. So it was really like a lot of iterations of, um, yeah, modeling uh, different parts of the system and growing the size of the model and increasing the complexity of the simulations and, and all of that. Um, and so I do have, I can put a bunch of tabs open here, <laughs> um, but I can just give a quick like demo of some of the documents that I put together. So like this is a specification that I have for the vote escrow mechanism um, was one of the first ones that I made. So um, yeah, just not in too much detail, but kind of like highlighting the variables, the parameters, um, the actions that would cause changes to the mechanism um, or to the states, uh, the different policy functions and yeah, each of each of the mechanisms. So this is like really specking it out in detail. And then this is essentially what I would implement um, in code. Um, and then I also have this Miro board is kind of crazy now, but uh, it really shows the iterations that I went through. Um, so these are all, each of these boxes is a uh, differential specification diagram. And um, I think this was my first one over here. So as you can see, it's like a bit, uh, yeah, it's a lot simpler than the last ones that I ended up at, um, which are, yeah, basically because the number of mechanisms grew, the number of policies grew, the number of states that I was tracking grew as I built the model up um, and expanded it to modeling other subsystems. So these are all sort of like iterations of my differential specification diagram. Um, and yeah, this is the subsystem diagram that I had showed earlier too. Um, so yeah, that that's like, uh, I think this slide is actually where most of my learnings about the modeling and simulation experience came from, um, was just like, cause this is stuff, I mean, you can read about uh, the importance of de deciding a modeling objective. You can read about the different iterations that you need to go through in order to um, run a simulation, but it's you, like reading it is not the same as doing it. <laughs> um, and there's a lot to learn as you go through these iterations and you really see how important they are. Um, so, yeah. Um, then just a little bit about the model structure. So now I'm going to start talking more about like the actual model that was designed um, and then the experiments we'll get to in a bit too. Um, so the model structure, it has two main, so I talked about the four subsystems, but it also has two main uh, entities. There's the vote escrow accounts. Um, and so these are accounts that are initialized by locking behavior assumptions. So there's basically token, ocean tokens that are sitting in the circulating supply. And every time step, I have some assumptions about how many of those are locked for how long between one week and four years. Um, and yeah, and so as a, um, when tokens are locked, a new vote escrow account is initialized. Uh, and then the data assets, there are a hundred of these entities in the model um, and they each have their own data consumption volume. 
and um, vote according to the VE, yeah, according to some voting logic. But um, the reason there's 100 is because the reward system actually um, specifies that the top 100 data assets are the ones that are eligible for rewards, uh, for receiving active rewards. So um, that was kind of nice. I didn't need to like initialize an infinite number of them or anything is uh, restricted to 100. Um, and then finally, to get an idea of like the progression of um, the model is each time step, these three um, chunks of logic would run. So the first, uh, yeah, the first thing to happen at the beginning of the time step is all of the behavioral assumptions would run. So um, the model would determine how many tokens, uh, how many ocean tokens should be locked. It would determine how much data consumption volume to add to which um, data assets, and it would determine which vote escrow tokens should be um, or were voted on which assets. So it would basically do all the behavioral assumptions. And then based on the behaviors that have changed the um, system state, the, uh, the reward system would calculate all of the rewards. So the passive, um, I didn't mention the fees yet, but it's quite small. So uh, yeah, the passive and the active um, rewards would get calculated. And then finally, the, uh, the vote escrow balance uh, would be recalculated because the vote escrow tokens actually decay over time. Um, this is a chart uh, or a table highlighting the behavioral assumptions that I made. Um, so as I was describing, there's three behavioral assumptions um, overall in the model. So there's the locking behavior, voting behavior, and consumption behavior. The locking behavior is what initializes or triggers the vote escrow accounts. The voting behavior is what um, allocates the vote escrow tokens to the data assets. And the consumption behavior is what uh, increases the data consumption volume of the individual assets. Um, and I'll maybe like pick one or two of these to talk about. Um, but basically, the the takeaway is that I um, try I tested a bunch of different behavioral assumptions just to see how um, making different assumptions would affect the model. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that in the experiment as well. But um, but yeah, one of them, I mean, the simple one is just linear locking behavior. So this is assuming um, that the locked percent of ocean increases linearly from 3% to 85% over eight years. Um, and I also had similar assumptions for data consumption um, so this is assuming that the data consumed volume would grow, um, yeah, with the sigmoid function shape uh, over the course of four years. Um, then to talk about the, the metrics that the model um, was uh, calculating. So basically each simulation um, would generate a, a whole bunch of system metrics, um, which is then what I would analyze to determine like the success or failure of a single run. Um, and so these are some of the metrics from the system that um, I was gathering. So circulating supply, the percent of locked tokens, the vote escrow balance, um, the active percent. So those are the tokens that are being um, actively voted with. Um, and then, yeah, things like the reward distributions and then, um, and then APYs. Oh, did I mention the APYs yet? I'm not sure I did. So, um, yeah, so the APYs were ended up, um, this, these are basically uh, metrics that represent the, like, the aggregate incentive um, for locking ocean. Um, so, oh, well, that was my, my assumption was that people would, users will be locking ocean um, as long as the APYs are rewarding them enough um, to do so. Uh, so, like, the main incentive for locking ocean is the passive APY, the main incentive for um, voting with your vote escrow tokens is active APY, um, and then I calculated an aggregate um, APY as well. And this is a screenshot from um, one of my specification documents, but yeah, uh, more detail on the APY metrics. Um, okay, so yeah, so that was the, that's the, the metrics and the um, KPIs of uh, or the metrics of the system. So now is actually getting into the experiments. Um, and 
there were so there were three experiments that were run. Um, the first two I'm going to kind of skip over quickly because um, they were more of like exploring the system dynamics. There are some like interesting findings, but it was mostly just me kind of like playing around with different behaviors um, and how they would affect um, the metrics. So, um, so this first experiment is made with pretty simple assumptions. Um, I'll, we'll look at the charts closer because it's easiest to, to tell from there, but um, pretty simple assumptions of a linear growth in the supply that's locked. And then I ran three different scenarios of low, medium, and high um, data consumed volume growth. Um, and I think I have the images of that one. Yeah, okay, so this is a big image of all of the system metrics that I just mentioned on the previous slide that were tracked for the this experiment. Um, and you can see in the top right hand corner, um, this is, I can't zoom in for some, there it is. Um, this is uh, essentially reflecting the linear um, growth in the locked supply that I was mentioning is one of the main assumptions. Um, and then the data consumption volume, these are the three functions that um, were assumed for the growth of the data consumed volume. Um, so yeah, so these two charts essentially reflect the, um, the assumptions that were made uh, for this experiment. Um, and then as for the, uh, let's see, what were some of the interesting results? There's a lot, lot of data to look at, so <laughs> I'm trying to pull out. Um, so yeah, the passive APY it gets very diluted um, with the higher locked, uh, with the higher percent of locked tokens, and the active data farming ceilings are quite restrictive. Okay, so that's um, essentially what I learned from this um, simulation is that we'll see down here in the bottom corner, this chart is showing the passive APY, um, and although it's quite high, like 20, 40, 60, up to 80 percent. Um, near the end of the simulation, it's very, it gets quite low and very diluted because of the percent, this is the um, denominator essentially, is the locked percent of tokens. So basically as these get higher, um, the passive APY decreases, which is what you would expect, but it's still interesting, I think, to see the actual like quantity, um, quantification of that. Um, and then the, the last thing, which I haven't really talked about is um, the the active rewards uh, they so this um, this chart is showing the um, the active reward distribution over time um, and the so these three there's two caveats to the active rewards distribution so the green line is the schedule um, so how many rewards at at most like the maximum amount of rewards that could be um, distributed for active rewards. Um, but there are two ceilings in the rewards logic. So there's one ceiling, which is um, that the active rewards can't exceed the data consumption volume times like 10% or something like that. So these red lines actually show a ceiling of active rewards according to the data consumption volume growth of the protocol. Um, and so this is this chart is essentially showing that like even though there is a significant um, amount of rewards, ocean tokens that are allocated to rewarding um, for active um, for active data farming, the data consumption volume ceiling is restricting like a significant number of those rewards um, from being distributed. So these rewards just end up staying in the treasury for, yeah. Um, to be used in the future, basically. But, but yeah. So that was that was one of the other observations from this. Um, is how restrictive the the ceilings are, um, which I'm not saying is a good or bad thing, but um, just noting. <laughs> uh, so then the second sort of exploration experiment um, that I ran was with slightly more um, interesting behavioral assumptions. Um, so I called it lazy locking. <laughs> um, which is where the uh, the amount of ocean 
tokens that were locked in the vote escrow mechanism um, is calculated based on an APY target. Um, so the idea would be that uh, users or token ocean token holders would not lock their ocean tokens if the APY was was too low, um, but they would lock their tokens if the APY was high enough, because um, APY being the main incentive for locking ocean. Um, and then the voting behavior, um, smart voting, I'm calling it, uh, is basically the idea of um, the the ocean the vote escrow ocean holders the VE ocean holders will only activate as much of their VE ocean as is needed in in order to reach the ceilings. Um, so I was explaining the the ceilings for the active rewards um, just on the previous images. And um, so yeah, basically, if as an ocean holder, if you have vote escrow ocean, um, there's not much incentive to activate more of it um, if you are already reaching the ceiling of the rewards because you won't actually earn any more rewards. It just takes more effort to decide where to, to vote, where to allocate your token. Um, and then, yeah, the same three assumptions for the consumption, um, uh, for the consumption behavior. And I will just pull these images up. Uh, okay, not those. Looks like this. So yeah, so these are like a little bit more, a little bit more going on here. Um, basically each of these scenarios is, um, each of the lines represents a different APY target. Um, so you can kind of see, uh, let's see, I can zoom in here. Um, so the APY targets that I had were like seven and a half percent, 15 percent, 17 and a half percent, like up to 30 percent about. Um, and yeah, the main takeaways for this analysis. Um, so here we can kind of see that there's a floor for the locked percent and the active percent of tokens. Um, the the reason that there is a floor is because the any any more tokens that would be locked would only dilute the APY below the target. So this is basically saying this is the minimum amount of um, ocean tokens that would be locked if uh, assuming this certain APY target. Um, so in the top right here, we can see that, um, yeah, we can see that the, the locked percent of tokens is actually declining in the future months of the simulation. Um, because the rewards are also declining and the logic, the behavioral assumptions are intended to maintain this APY. So in order to maintain the APY, the amount of tokens that are locked needs to decrease. Um, yes, and then, uh, yeah, so these charts, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip that part, <laughs> but we can come back, we can come back to this experiment um, if anyone is, was interested afterwards, but I want to get first to the maybe more interesting or at least visually appealing <laughs> um, part of the simulation, um, and that is the the full full experiment. So the um, the full simulations where I was essentially sweeping um, system and behavior parameters. Um, so I mentioned these behavioral assumptions that I made. Uh, and um, and then there there are also other system parameters um, such as let's see oh I think I had a link um, yeah and there's other system parameters um, such as the lock duration um, the lock amount so how many um, how much ocean is actually being locked in the vote escrow account uh, and yeah, things like that. So all of these parameters um, were basically given a range. So um, yeah, some of the ranges would be like 35 to 85%, uh, which is the probability that a vote escrow account is opened um, or initialized in a given time step. As for the amount 
for that um, boat escrow account, it would either be, be it would be somewhere between fifty to fifty thousand to five million. Um, so pretty wide ranges, but the simulation would essentially sweep across all of these ranges. And I think in the end, um, ran eight hundred and some uh, runs. So there was, yeah, eight hundred. Oh, I have it at the top. 288, 288 combinations of behavior assumptions um, were simulated for a period of 16 years. Um, so, yeah. So combining all of the parameter sweeps um, ended up with, yeah, there it is, 288 total runs over 16 years each. Um, and the, these charts are not as, um, informative because they're quite messy, but I think they're still kind of interesting to look at just to get an idea of the, um, like the metric space that was covered by sweeping all of these parameters. Um, so just to like pick one that we've already looked at. So the locked percent, um, this chart is, so in the previous experiments, I had assumed, uh, for one of them, I had assumed that the locked percent was going to be linear growth um, over the course of these eight years or 16 years. Um, but in the um, with the Monte Carlo simulations that I was running, um, the locked percent, because of the behavior assumptions um, and the randomness of the behavior assumptions, um, the locked percent covered a much wider um, range. And so basically, like combining the uh, the Monte Carlo, like the randomness of the simulations with the different parameters, um, allowed a much wider range of system states to be um, experienced through the simulation, or to be covered through the simulation. Um, and yeah, again, <laughs> quite like messy and and hard to. Um, actually pull like insights out of just by looking at it, but that is partially why um, for the next topics, oh, I don't have it in the slides, but that is partially why I can pull it up on the report. Um, the actual analysis of the output. So this, all of this data is obviously collected in a data frame and I have plotted it here, but it can also be analyzed um, through other methods. Um, and one of those methods that um, I chose was uh, like sort of a KPI um, generating or calculating KPIs off of these, um, off of the data set of the simulation data and, um, and then running some machine learning algorithms to um, analyze what parameters um, what parameter ranges and which parameters specifically were influencing the outcomes of those simulations. So um, the two, there were two KPI scenarios, or sorry, two KPIs um, that I looked at specifically in terms of the analysis. So um, the, the analysis of this like full simulation. Um, so the two KPIs were uh, an aggregate APY target um, so this KPI was measured as a success when the aggregate APY was greater than 5% for at least 70% of the time steps. Um, so this KPI, I was kind of, the thought process was basically that um, this represents successfully, if this KPI is successful for a given simulation, then the token economic model successfully incentivized locking ocean because the APY was high enough it was re it was high enough to reward people um, who were locking their ocean um, for the majority of the time steps. Um, the second KPI um, is a combination of the aggregate and the active um, APYs. And the reason for this is because this KPI wanted to try and capture the um, the incentive to curate data assets. So this was sort of like part two of the, uh, the, the overall system goals um, was 
Uh, so part one was incentivizing users to lock their ocean tokens. Part two was incentivizing users to curate data assets. Um, and yeah, so KPI two was uh, related to that because we also bring in the active API. Um, and then to summarize the analysis of these two KPIs, um, so the results of this, of analyzing KPI one, so basically calculating this, calculating this, um, this KPI for every, all of the 288 simulations, this KPI was successful 56% of the time. Um, and so that would be me, like, based on my um, assumptions would be implying that the ocean protocol token economic uh, model incentives successfully incentivizes locking ocean 56% of the time um, in these simulations. And uh, to go a little bit deeper, um, the so this analysis here um, is a kernel density estimate. Um, which is a machine learning model that I learned about <laughs> for the first time running this um, analysis, uh, but I've actually come across it a few times since, which is cool. Um, and basically the idea is, I can zoom in on one of these, I'll go with the top left um, to just explain this chart a little bit. So um, the, the orange line is the count, uh, or, so the orange line represents successful runs. So it's when the KPI was um, calculated and determined to be successful. So it's one of those 56% uh, of the simulation. And um, yeah, so that's the the orange line. The blue line is the failures. So when the, when the simulation was not successful. And then the, the density of it is basically the count of successful simulations that relate to this um, parameter value. So in this case, it's actually a, this is a bit of a confusing example, but um, the lock duration assumption. So if you remember the locking behavior is um, related to uh, locking ocean to create a vote escrow account. And um, as a user, you can lock your tokens for between one week and four years. And in these simulations, I actually ran, um, there was, a parameter is part of the parameter sweeps uh, to change the duration um, of to change the window for um, how long the vote escrow accounts would be locked. Um, so one of the there were four four different windows. One window was between one week and four years. One window was between one week and two years. One week one window was one year and three years. So it kind of like shifted in two year chunks. Um, and basically these, so these are um, corresponding to the numbers zero, one, two, and three, which are corresponding to these numbers zero, one, two, and three. And this is basically saying that um, the parameter number one, which is the one week to two years lock duration was responsible for or correlated with the most number of successful um, successful simulation. Um, so that makes sense um, if you think about it because the lock duration is, um, I realize I maybe didn't mention this as much, but the vote escrow, um, hopefully people are a bit familiar with the vote escrow mechanism. The longer you lock your tokens for, the more, the higher um, balance you, re you receive in vote escrow tokens. Um, if you only lock your tokens for one week, if you lock 100 tokens, you would get a small amount, maybe like 10 um, vote escrow tokens. If you locked 100 tokens for four years, you would actually get 100. Um, and then that number, either 10 or 100, decays over time. Um, but essentially, this is saying um, that the, the shorter lock periods were associated with more successful uh, simulations because when you lock your tokens for a shorter amount of time, 
there are fewer vote escrow tokens in circulation and vote escrow tokens is the denominator for the APYs. Um, so VE Ocean is the denominator for the APYs. So it would make sense that if in our simulation, if we assume that the lock durations are short, then we're more likely to see higher APYs, um, which is actually kind of an interesting, uh, it, it does make sense if you think about it, but it's also interesting as it relates to the goals of the, um, of the, the token economic model, because um, yeah, the goal is specifically to incentivize locking ocean. Uh, and you would think the longer you lock, the better, because there's just more, lo more ocean locked away for a longer time period. Um, but this is actually saying that the longer duration, so if, if everyone is locking up for four years, it's more likely that the APYs will drop below a certain level. Um, and if you're, yeah, and then that will obviously affect people's assumption or affect people's decision to lock in the future. So, um, so it's kind of like, yeah, an interesting dynamic to observe, I think, um, related to the lock, uh, the lock duration assumption. Um, and then, yeah, the, maybe I'll pick one thing out from the second KPI as well. Um, so the second KPI, KPI is, as I mentioned, the combination of aggregate and active APY. The first KP, KPI was only aggregate. Um, and so the, the point of the second KPI here is to try and capture some of the incentive to also curate data assets. Um, so not only incentivizing people to lock them, but also incentivizing people to curate by voting with their token. Um, and the conclusion here was, or the findings from the simulation was basically that 35% of the simulations were successful um, with, yeah, for this KPI. So 35% of the simulations in successfully incentivized users to both lock their tokens and curate data assets. Um, similar findings uh, in terms of like which parameters or which behavior assumptions um, were driving the, these outcomes, uh, the lock behavior and the lock probability. Um, but one that's new and interesting also to, to think about is um, the weekly vote success probability. So I don't know if I've mentioned this yet, but basically um, the, uh, the holders of vote escrow tokens are, when they vote with their tokens, they vote on data assets. And if they vote on the wrong data asset, they won't, the wrong data asset, meaning one that doesn't generate much data consumption volume, then they won't actually receive many rewards. Um, so the success of your vote also determines um, how high your active rewards are. Uh, and so this, I think this finding is, is interesting because if we look at it on the kernel density estimate chart, um, we can see that the, so the three parameter values that were swept across was 15% success, 40% success and 65 or something like that. Um, and we can see that, yeah, so there was much more success. Uh, the simulations were more successful um, with the lower vote success rate. Um, yeah, with the lower vote success rate. And that is because the lower success rate means that fewer vote escrow Ocean, or vote escrow tokens were allocated to a ranked data set, and that number is the denominator for the active APY. Um, so while this isn't like specifically saying, or it's, it's not saying um, too much about the, uh, like which behavior, um, how do I put this? I think, yeah, so this, this one is, I, I think this is interesting because it it sort of implies that there is more to there's more to look at here. So there's more to investigate as it relates to the success of um, voting 
for uh, yeah, basically like the competition within the, the the market of data curation. So you're in a in a sense you're competing with other people that are voting. Um, you're trying to vote. You're trying to find a voting strategy that's better than someone else's because if you do, you are more likely to collect more uh, active rewards than them. So there's this like interesting um, voting strategy uh, layer of the of the vote escrow mechanism. Um, which is, yeah, this this finding is suggesting that it's important um, and in determining the overall success of uh, the token economic model. Um, but I'll, I mentioned it, I think, in the next slide. Uh, this is one of the areas that I think would be interesting to like investigate further um, the vote success. So, yeah, so those were the three experiments that I ran. The first two were related more to like exploring the dynamics. The third one was a giant parameter sweep across a bunch of behaviors and different assumptions. Um, and then I calculated a KPIs based on the system metrics and then did some analysis of the data. Um, uh, did some KPI analysis to try and uh, learn which parameters and which values um, were driving the results. Um, then to just kind of wrap up here with some model improvements and further experiment ideas. Um, so I think if I could spend more time on this, I would want to improve behavior assumptions. Um, I just made like pretty crude ones relating to locking, voting, and consumption. Um, I did get to experiment with different ones, but uh, they were still sort of, I don't know, arbitrary. Um, I just kind of came up with them. Basically, um, yeah, I just kind of came up with them myself, but I think it would be interesting to look, actually look at data um, like that exists from the Ocean Protocol and uh, try and understand a little bit what, what people's actual behaviors are. Because this protocol has been live for a while, the vote escrow mechanism has been live for a while. Um, and yeah, so I think that would be interesting. Um, the data consumption volume assumption uh that's a little complicated i'll skip that one <laughs> um and then yeah i would also think it'd be interesting to consider um other environmental factors like market conditions or token price so this this simulation is quite like um it's closed within ocean protocol there's there's not really many environmental factors that could uh shock the system in different ways um, from the outside um so i think that would be interesting to consider um Finally, yeah, future experiments. I've thought uh, fees. So fees is something that I didn't don't think I mentioned once um, in this presentation because it, yeah, with the parameter for the fee value is extremely small right now. Um, basically, the, the fee that Ocean Protocol charges to use their their uh, protocol is very small, um, but it could have really interesting implications if it were larger. And if data consumption volume were larger because a portion of the fee is actually burned. Um, so I think this parameter would be really interesting to, to investigate more. Um, yeah, for that reason, because of the burning, basically. Um, and yeah, there's, I have had a lot of ideas about like different agent based um, analysis. This is, oh, this is, I'm basically talking about the, um, the voting strategies. Uh, that I was mentioning. So, um, yeah, the different voting strategies for curating data assets. I think it'd be interesting to run like agent based simulations with specific strategies for populations of agents and different utility functions for those agents. Um, and yeah, see how that affects the macroeconomic um, indicators like APY. Uh, and then <laughs> to close out with some takeaways and challenges. Um, so process is important. I think these are all <laughs> related to the first slide that I had. Um, oh no, the second modeling goals, framework and process. Um, so basically process is important. Like there were tons of iterations and with the different materials, I didn't get to actually go through many of them, but, um, I have, yeah, this Miro board plus a ton of hack MDs and other documents that I was using. Um, and so having like an organized process of 
uh, of iterating through these materials and updating them um, is extremely helpful for keeping yourself organized uh, because there are going to be a lot of iterations when doing things like this, projects like this. Um, the second would be um, that small changes in the modeling objective can actually end up requiring large changes to the model design. Um, and it sounds maybe obvious if you think about it, but there were like iterations where I would think, oh, this would actually be a cool feature to add. And then I would go through a few of the steps of the process and then get to the implementation on the um, programming side and just realize that it would completely change um, parts of the model. So uh, yeah, so it can be, it's important to like align on a modeling objective. Um, and finally, yeah, quantifying the impacts of outcomes is very helpful. This is also seems pretty obvious, but um, but like I guess my point was that it's there's just so much going on. There's a lot of charts to look at, and it's really um, like any analysis that's uh, yeah, it's it's easy to make like subjective um, decisions about um, analyzing the data. So I think using the machine learning algorithms and the method of like generating system metrics and calculating KPIs is a great way to like put structure behind your analysis um, and draw some interesting conclusions. Um, so yeah, that is my presentation. Sorry for talking at everyone for an hour. <laughs> um, and I hope that was a little bit interesting. Um, and if you have any questions about the experiments or the behavioral assumptions or wanna like look more at the code or the model, um, I would be happy to take those and maybe, yeah, this is the last thing I'll show is, this is the report I basically am like talking from right now, but I'll also share this afterwards. You can read more detail about um, the experiments and see the charts and stuff. So yeah, I'll finish there. <laughs> see if anyone's still hanging around. I think there have been some questions in the chat. I have also some oh, more, cool. but uh, should we? take the ones in the chat first. Yeah, definitely. So first of all, let me thank you, Peter. This was extremely interesting and very well prepared. Uh, we had some questions in the chat, uh, but most of them, so at least mine, have been already answered by you in the course of the presentation. So thank you for you know thinking ahead and, and presenting all of those answers already. But I'm happy to dedicate a little bit more, more time to the discussion. All in all, uh, the presentation was super interesting and the project that you've uh, that you've done also. So congratulations on doing this um, and you know like from uh, from scratch, so to say, even by um, individually um, and on your own um, defining the objectives um, of the model without much consultation, right? So you even um, you even um, researched what would be the system goal, what would be the system objective, and based on your analysis, then you found okay, it's to be interesting to to analyze um, a particular problem and and build the model out of it and and try to answer it. So like this was super, super impressive um, that uh, without further input or without any anything that you could base on, uh, you were um, dissecting this model on your own. So this is what impressed me most. But uh, let me go to the um, to the present to the, to the chat. Uh, there was a question, I think, by Angela, who was the first um, in the chat to ask. This one I think is answered. I want what to go. Major challenges. Yeah, I, I feel this this has been at least for myself perfectly fine. Let's go yeah, to cool. Sir Ambrose. I have some more questions. <laughs> cool. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so uh, Taremba, they asked, uh, "What sort of equilibriums have you been observing, and where are uh, there are situations where you had to change assumptions, mechanisms, because the simulations were suggesting that system stability could not be obtained?" Um, have you mm. been looking at the equilibriums um, in your analysis? Yeah, not so much the equilibriums. I think that would um, maybe come out of like, if I was making individual agent based, if it was more of like an agent based simulation and I was making assumptions on the agent level and then they were, those agents were like behaving according to their utility functions, then I think that's where you would see more equilibriums at like the macro level. But since I was making like pretty wide um, behavioral assumptions, like that would affect, you know, like single behavioral assumption is the behavioral assumption for the entire model. Um, I was observing more just system dynamics. So it was like, what, uh, yeah, what states of the system, what states would the system reach given certain behavioral assumptions? 
Um, so I, I didn't really see many equilibriums. Um, but that said, I, I mean, with the behavioral assumptions I was making, I would see situations where like the locked supply would go all the way to 100%. <laughs> and that is not really possible because you need tokens in circulation. Um, so like I would need, to, when I made those behavioral assumptions, the lock supply goes to 100, I'd realize, okay, that's not a good assumption for locking behavior um, because it's not realistic, obviously, because that's not an outcome that would be possible or wanted. So I would change those assumptions. Cool. Um, so that happened a few times, yeah. Perfect. Uh, yeah, so this is quite natural that when you have uh, those, you know, straightforward um, assumptions that you've made that you will not get to an equilibrium behavior besides the one that you mentioned is obvious, right? Like, so this is going to happen because we're assuming this to develop like this and therefore this is going to be the equilibrium outcome in the long run. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if I can if I can just say I, I actually think what you, what you mentioned is super interesting because uh it's probably well it's a huge task to start modeling with with actual agents or with to to have sort of more more dynamic whether you model agents or or more of a, I don't know like a diffusion process or something like that but but the fact that already with quite um quite um uh, specific behavior assumptions you were able to 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 notice that some assumptions were were giving you this this result that you will have like 100 percent locked or 100 i think that's that's already quite quite telling and and useful mm -hmm. um so did you have any any more of of uh observations of of this type uh um, or, or... i can't really think of any off the top of my head, but like you can, so you can see them in, um, in like these charts that are super messy, but like this is, yeah. So these are some scenarios where the locked percent went up to a hundred. Um, I can't remember which, I, I don't know. Yeah. Which, uh, experiment these are related to, but, um, yeah, so that it did happen a few times and just kind of looking at these charts, you can maybe see some, uh, yeah, some metric outcomes that don't seem right. And then that's when I would go back and check the behavioral assumptions. Um, but if you wanna look through the report, all these charts and everything are, are linked in there. If you, I think if you add comments, I would get notifications. So if you're wondering like which assumptions were made with this chart or whatever, um, be happy to, to figure that out. That'd be interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Uh, very quickly to my two questions. Um, uh, one of them uh, you answered by the end. So um, I was I, I didn't send it in the prop in proper time, but actually I was wondering at the beginning uh, which model type you are building, and uh, it was a system dynamics model, right? If I got it correctly. So um, mm -hmm. you didn't make any assumptions about agents and their behaviors, but you have one representative kind of agent that is doing everything, right? It's like you would have one person locking or unlocking from the floating supply right yeah yeah exactly each locking action would create a new vote escrow account but it's yeah essentially one agent cool. making the decision yeah perfect yeah um and even then you didn't really have an arrival process assumption but more of a um prescribed um linear function that is uh, assuming the, the locking rate right yeah i well so the first experiment i had a linear locking rate um the second the the full like full simulation i had um the assumptions were stochastic so it was um the daily there was a daily lock probability um and then a uniform random locking amount um and then uniform random locking duration so each time step there would be yeah according to this probability that amount and that duration um, there would be a new vote escrow account created. Yeah. Cool, but you wouldn't distinguish between those accounts then, right? So uh, it no. would still be, yeah, okay. But yeah, so this is kind of the first step of how you could uh, um, diverge into um, an agent-based analysis mm -hmm. of, you know, having different accounts performing differently or like performing different actions, right? So mm -hmm. presu presumably, right? Yeah. Cool. 
uh, yeah, so the next question is regarding the success criteria, but you did answer it immediately afterwards. So like when as when I typed it, you already answered it by the kind of analysis okay. below, right? So this cool. is kind of what what I was wondering about if there is a mapping between under which conditions do you get to uh, you know a successful achievement of the KPI or not? And uh, this is what you said. So there are some probabilities for some selections that you can um, show on this kernel graph. Mm -hmm. uh, indicating that under particular selections, you will have a higher probability of success. Yeah, yeah, I think that's this uh, the kernel density estimate charts. Cool, perfect. May so I those add, are the questions. Yeah, yeah. just Angela. quickly, I I noticed that we are running out of time. And um, yeah, thanks, Peter, for this presentation. It's so awfully rich, and I. What, what stood out to me is how important the step of uh, defining KPIs is and deriving KPIs to um, mm. draw conclusions uh, uh, regarding your research question. And I think, actually, I have a question, but maybe this could be another hour if you would be open for this to discuss how you derive KPIs or more approaches to KPIs. Because just now, I wonder on a scale from zero to 10, how how confident or how much you cover from to answer the research question, how um, on a scale from zero to 10, how secure are you that you have found a set of KPIs to answer this question? Yeah, um, yeah, not very high, honestly. Yeah, no. um, I, I mean, I only have two. I would yeah. have a lot more if I, if I could. I think part of the problem was that I mean these are just like it's a big project and, and a lot to, yeah so I, I don't um yeah but uh yeah it's just a lot uh I mean I was also like learning a lot of about um yeah just like developing and like programming mm -hmm. the model and everything for the first yeah. time so I think that took a lot of like building something that works was hard enough <laughs> and then um as like a cherry on top I was able to like loop in loop together some KPIs to answer the question um, but yeah, I, these KPIs, it's only two of them and they're pretty mm -hmm. like rough, I think, as for like drawing like really, um, like rigorous conclusions. Um, but that would be certainly one area I think to, um, to think more critically about, uh, like how those KPIs are decided and then, mm -hmm. yeah, doing the analysis yeah. to see what they, it would be suggest. super yeah, think about it. Maybe there's a yeah. chance uh, to take some time to dig into that. Um, and thanks again for presenting and, yeah. and doing this work. Uh, uh, amazing. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> it was cool. Peter, awesome. how, how long do you uh, would you say did it take you to perform this from, from start to, to end? Oh, um, well, I was working on it over the course of like six weeks, maybe. Um, yeah, maybe two months. I forget when I started exactly, but um, yeah, it was, I don't know how many hours that would be, maybe like 10, 15 hours a week or something. Hard to say, but it was, yeah, over the course of six weeks, six to eight weeks, um, a lot nice. of iterations. I was actually doing it as part of the study group, Token Engineering Academy um, Complex Systems Study Group uh, with Zane. I don't know if anyone has come up met him before but no this is definitely yeah. a very interesting group to participate in so like if you have a com uh, coming up with such impressive models this is cool uh, yeah. a cool group to join uh, let me ask you one final question you did mention this by the end um, of your presentation so um, I, I mean how does your model perform if it's uh, you know under a re reality check so uh, compared to the real system behavior or compared to real data, uh, did you think about this a little bit? Did you investigate further? Uh, are your um, um, results only, you know, academic in a sense of, you know, based on the assumptions that you have, you have some results or do you see them, you know, being reflected in, um, in the reality, reality as well? Um, well, I, I kind of, I, if I did some back testing, I don't think that um, the, yeah, I don't think that the what I've seen in the model is has necessarily happened, or like I, I guess I don't really know what the um, the actual uh, like real data would show for like locking percentages and locking behavior. Um, I didn't didn't do any of the like back testing or analysis of that. Um, I think that would be one of like the best ways to improve the model would be to like see what's actually happening in the real world. Like I was saying, I think Ocean has been 
the vote escrow um, mechanisms have been live and the rewards system, uh, the data farming rewards have been live for like a year now. So I think that would be really interesting to um, collect some data and see how that would inform some of the behavioral assumptions. But but yeah, I didn't do any of that before deciding these assumptions. So um, it's probably more academic in that sense. But that said, I did like kind of craft the assumptions so that uh, system metrics would be generated in like reasonable uh, levels. So like the locking behavior, um, the locking behavior assumptions were kind of crafted so that the percent locked would, uh, you know, not exceed 100 or um, hover around 60 or something. I don't know. Um, yeah, so I was trying to like think of reasonable levels for system metrics and then get behavior ranges that would land or yeah, make behavior assumptions that would land in those ranges. And then I added um, like stochastic um, stochastics to that um, to like cover a wider range of assumptions. So, um, but yeah. So in, in, this, in this sense, <laughs> yeah, in this sense, a st stylized model to, yeah. um, to, to show some, some of the functionalities and basics of, of, of yeah. the components. Yeah, cool. No, thank you yeah, so definitely. much, Peter. It was it was very impressive, and and thanks so much for taking the time. And I would love to continue the conversation if you want. They're digging deeper into the code, or you know, showing some experiments, or really going um into the weeds of of the of of the experiments that you've done. So, um, if you have time and interest, maybe we can continue the discussion. But definitely, uh, you know, um, the group that you that you're working with and and. Uh, your initiative here is uh, worth uh, following, so I will take uh, take care of of trying to to join join and and make sure cool. that I'm I'm in, include a collaboration with you guys on this. So, <laughs> cool. Thank you so much uh, for for your time today, and thank you everyone who participated and asked questions. It was a very interesting um, session. Awesome. Yeah, I'll share. I think the report and the presentation in the Discord is that the best way to. You can do this. I mean, we intend to upload this on on YouTube if you're interested, oh, right. if you allow. So like, so we could also link this to link the documents there accordingly, and then everyone would be available to to get them. Okay. Cool. Yeah, that works. Perfect. Thank you so much, guys. See you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. See you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.